Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in. If tuning in is the right term for Zoom events, uh, I never really know what to say on that. Uh, but thank you for being here uh, in front of your PCs and laptops and phones uh, for our end of panel event, uh, end of semester panel event, even uh, celebrating regionality. Uh, so, on behalf of uh, myself, Dr. Charlie Barnes, and Dr. Lisa Blower, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you all um, to our conversation with our special guest this evening when, and uh, uh, a couple of uh, big news items that we're going to push out to you as well. Um, this is a, an Arts Fest event, so big thanks to the Arts Fest team uh, and Claire Bookerfield in particular, uh, who uh, do enormous things behind the scenes and lots of really important stuff. And uh, Arts Fest Online continues to be a, a great source of uh exciting and interesting material for people uh so i've got a few notes uh that i'm going to start with and then uh, we'll dive straight into uh this evening's discussions so our guest for this evening studied english and american literature at the university of east anglia his first novel uh, afterglow uh, is a dark and, and brutal family drama uh, set in the black country uh, and this won the 2004 Betty Trask Award and was shortlisted for the John Llewellyn Rees Memorial Prize, the James Tate Black Memorial Prize and the Commonwealth Writers Prize. His second novel, Heartlands, uh, a novel that's about football and the, the, the clashes and the connections of different cultures and communities and the threat of uh, far right movements in the Midlands. Uh, was adapted for the BBC Book at Bedtime and was shortlisted for the 2010 Commonwealth Writers' Prize. Uh, in 2012, his third novel, How I Killed Margaret Thatcher, was published. Uh, and this tells the tale of a young boy coming of age uh, during the upheavals uh, of the region, moving from being an industrial heartland to a kind of post-industrial limbo. Uh, this was shortlisted for the Gordon Byrne Prize. In 2016, Iron Towns was published, and this is a, a really beautiful, stunning portrayal of Britain set against the backdrop of, a, of an ageing footballer at a struggling football club, uh, and a novel that's haunted by Anglo-Saxon battles and Saxon ghosts. Uh, 2017 saw his Brexit novel, The Cut, uh, published. Uh, which traces the relationship between black country pugilist uh, and still my favourite uh, named character in literary history, Cairo Dukes, uh, and his relationship with a Hampstead documentary filmmaker, uh, and also contains one of the most panic-stricken, visceral opening scenes in contemporary literature. Um, he's a good friend of the creative and professional writing uh, team here at Wolves, uh, having done quite a few of the uh, events with us with uh, Wolverhampton Literature and uh, Literature Festival and Arts Fest, and uh, I've dragged him into quite a few things uh, with me over the years. Uh, he's also featured in uh, mine and uh, Professor Groh's book, Smell, Memory and Literature in the Black Country. And um, to prove he's a man of uh, impeccable taste, he also wrote the introduction to my debut novel, Bella. Uh, he is, of course, the wonderful Anthony Cartwright. Anthony. Hello. Hello. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I'm. What an introduction. Thank, thanks a lot for that. Um, I've got to live up to it. I mean, our discussion tonight. But uh, yeah, it's really nice to be. Here. It's really be, nice to be part of the the, the discussion and um, and to join me tonight. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Well, <clears throat> I thought we might start with hearing some of your work, Anthony, and uh, if you could give us a little bit of a reading of, uh, well, your choice. Uh, yeah, you OK. Read, uh, to kind of well, introduce us into sort of regional literature and the ideas that we're going to be playing with. Yeah. So um, so I'm going to go back a few years. and I'm going to go back to the, um, the, the novel called How I Killed Margaret Thatcher, which you um, just introduced. But really to read, read a passage where... Um, I wondered if it was something we might, you know, introduce things we might come back to during conversation tonight, or people might be interested in regarding um, regarding regional literature. And I don't know, like whether that even to think about a definition of it, and just to think about the way that um, I guess one approach for me writing about Dudley particularly, and 
you know, the black country more widely, the West Midlands more widely than that, is um, is how is how place itself, um, like the landscape and the activity in it, like you know, shapes people and shapes characters and like really specifically. Um, and so the bit I'm going to read is um, is connected quite a bit with um, with Dudley Zoo and with the castle and um, actually mentioning the, the court. So, if, yeah, the, the, the court was commissioned, you know, in terms of like I was asked to write it in as a series of this sort of fiction in reaction to Brexit, and it, ju it just struck me then when you're introducing it, I, I could I could have um, I could have used the passage from there because it's, it's the in terms of the, the the area, it's like where I've come back to lots of times in telling stories and talking about characters, and I'm actually doing some new writing that that relates back to it as well. So that's the sort of um, yeah introduction, and also a way that um, a way that some of the stuff might work back to. Um, other writers uh, like I worked out the other day that um, if you take the pubs in Liz, Pe in Liz Berry's Christmas Eve poem like I, I grew up writing them if you draw a square like literally where, where I grew up was right in the middle of the the, the, the pubs um, um, which relates to this passage because it's in two voices and the older voice of Sean Ball, who, um, who we're going to hear from now, he's keeping a pub um, in sort of um, contemporary Dudley. It was written in, like, say, say about 2010. And um, and it could easily be one of the pubs listed in the, the um, Lisberry poem. Like, he's trying to revive, like, uh, a, a pub. Um, the, the pub in this book's called The, the Crow Core Inn, but it could be, like... Um, the struggler, as mentioned in 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 the poem, so I don't know. There's that kind of um, maybe there's that kind of uh, what would you call it? Like, I don't know relationship or like trying to. Um, I realise, by the way, Lisberry says in about thirty lines what I was trying to say in about three hundred pages. Well, that's that's another that's another story. Maybe we will get onto that as well. Anyway, we hear two voices. The first is um, Sean um, as a and Sean is an eight-year-old. Eight, sorry, in this in this section, Sean is a ten-year-old, and then the adult voice is a is a thirty-year-old, and they kind of overlap in the course of the of the story. Um, there's a lot of names in this, but I thought it might be useful to us, um, partly because it specifically names lots of stuff about um, Dudley and the setting. Um, Sean and his and his um, uncle who's quite young and he's like nearer in age like he's, his uncle's 20 they've, they've had a kind of run in um with some skinheads uh previous to this sort of scene so we start with sean's voice as a as a younger boy if there's a war the russians will drop a nuclear bomb on birmingham so we'd have to go underground and live in the caves that's how human life might survive when i look at the pattern of the trial of its bodies I think of the labyrinth underneath us, the twists and turns. There are lakes and great caverns under Dudley. There's one by the zoo called the Singing Cavern. It's so big, you'd have to ride across it in a ship. That's where we'll live if they drop the bombs. It moves to the adult voice. I used to dream of Theseus striding through the labyrinth to kill the Minotaur, of Bilbo creeping through the misty mountain tunnels with his magic ring. Stories from the books I read. I imagined how we'd evolve as we lived underground. How we'd end up in, with huge eyes and curved backs, like the Morlocks in the time machine. Slowly, we change into pale frogs, worms burrowing back into the water and the dark. And back to the young Sean. Sean said hello to some of your mates this morning, don't you, Sean? As my dad says this, I see Johnny flinch at the kitchen table and I don't want my dad to say anything more. Do you, Sean? My dad says again, because I'm ignoring him. I nod. All right, Johnny says. My dad's smiling. He thinks it's funny that I might know skinheads. I'm not sure why. He must know them. That he, he must know they're not Johnny's mate. Could never be. Who was that, Sean? What was the names? 
I don't know, I say. Well, they know, Joe, let's put their thumb up. I pretend that I'm trying to remember. There's no point pretending. I can tell from Johnny's face that he knew who it was. Is it Steve? I say, I say. And Paulie and Yvette. They had a dog, a whippet. All oh, right, Johnny says. They look well, my dad says, skinheads. When she's wearing and all with her hair all shaved off. He says this as my granddad comes into the room. What? Them skinheads? Yo, stay away from them. Don't get mixed up with them. My granddad points the potato peeler at Johnny. He's been peeling potatoes for me now. And don't get mixed up with him. We want you to keep your hair on, don't we, Sean? Hey? Eh? All right. They are really my mates, Johnny says. Don't get mixed up with them. That's what I'm telling you. My granddad keeps the potato, potato peeler aimed at him. All right, Johnny says. Then he says, I am 20 years old, though. It's up to me and my mate, Sam. Oh, I'm telling you. My granddad keeps staring at him. Later, Johnny talks to my dad quietly at the kitchen table. He keeps looking up to check my granddad's not listening. My dad nods his head and then he gets up to pour a drink and puts Johnny on and pats Johnny on the shoulder, tells him not to worry about it. And it's the adult Sean. They were beautiful. Johnny's drawings, paintings. He drew all the time. Soft pencil in the first place, in the sketchbooks he kept on the garb, cobwebs, the castle, the lion factory roofs. He didn't do people very often, apart from those pictures of Natalie and the portrait he did of my mum. On Sundays, or on light nights when he was back from working time, he'd do watercolours, flowers, or the shed and a row of cabbages over the fence in the allotments, or the clouds floating over us. At the caravan, he'd sit with his back to the sea wall and paint green, black seaweed and orange starfish or the light falling on the hills. He tried to show me sometimes. We'd sit together at the kitchen table and I'd copy the lines that he'd made on the page. But I couldn't even do that. It was about a way of looking at things. I had my books. I could see things in my own head. I thought about how he looked at things. Tried to see some of the magic. I think of them now, Johnny's drawings, with the cable cars moving in an arc across the town, cobwebs threading between geraniums. He still draws, I know that. There are piles of sketchbooks in the corner of his bedroom. The rest are in the loft. I never ask him about it. I did once when we first started doing food. I asked him about putting some up, seeing if, seeing if people would buy them. He nodded and said yes, but didn't offer anything. I think of Jermaine's face when I asked him that time and his son, yeah, peace artist. And I think of the pile of exercise books I used to have up in smoke, the plans for an assassination, a revolution. And he planned to go and kill Margaret Thatcher as the book title maybe gives away. Um, I'm glad they're ash. Whereas Johnny's sketchbooks, I should ask him again. About the time I went to work for Diane, the Richardson brothers published plans to build the world's tallest tower at Merry Hill, next to the new shopping centre. We could have looked out to sea from the top. Each day, the pub had been in its shadow for a while. It was ridiculous. But by that point, anything was possible. It never got built, but the idea itself was enough. I put copies of the drawings up in an alcove by the bar and the Betkins animal houses, open over where the old fireplace was, I'd like Johnny's cable cars up there too, somewhere, and his cobwebs, if only I could ask him properly. The Sunday after that walk with my dad, he and Johnny went out together. That afternoon, the camera was sitting on the kitchen table. Uh, the skinheads had robbed the camera. I knew it would turn up eventually, my granddad said. I found it at the back of the cupboard, Johnny said. Johnny took me to the park one night that week. And we saw Steve walking down Watson's Green Road towards us. He had a black eye. Crossed the road when he saw us coming. You should fight fire with fire. Yvette, Steve's old girlfriend, comes in the pub sometimes with her husband. She works at an old people's home in Blackheath. Worked for a while with Michelle at the day centre. Michelle, Michelle says she's a lovely woman. Yvette says, perm now. Kids all right, she asks. I'm getting big. I don't know where the time goes, Sean, I doubt. 
people lived in the caves until the 50s, not underground, but in the rock houses down at Kimbredge. The edge is what's left of a desert, millions of years old. We'd visit sometimes on quiet afternoons, and me and Ronnie would scramble up and down the forest, climbing the cliff and the trees, our hands red with the standstone. There were ashes in some of the caves from recent fires, shapes cut in the walls, for what had been shelves, graffiti scored into the soft stone. This is where we'll live, I thought, as we ran up and down, pretending to be Robin Hood. This is where we'll come to disappear. Okay, thanks. That was brilliant. Thanks so much, Anthony. It's really lovely to hear you reading that as well. It's, it's been a while since I, uh, I read uh, How I Killed Margaret Thatcher. And I, I, it was one of the books that I, I read and, and kind of offered an insight into it with my PhD. So it's so lovely to kind of hear it from your mouth as well. Uh, and indeed, Teresa in our chat has mentioned now Black Country words always sound so raw and yet magical when read that's by lovely genuine that's nice. black country folk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, let's move on a little bit to uh, some, of the, some of the questions that we want to ask. Uh, and I hope my, uh, my colleagues jump in whenever they, they, uh, they wish to. Um, but I'd like to go back to, to some of the things that you said in your, your introduction to, to that piece. Um, and, and, and open up uh, a couple of questions on, on the back of that. So what is it that you think regional literature is? And why is regional writing important? What does it offer that other pieces of literature might not, do you think? Uh, that's, it's, that's, that's a really, that's a great question. I think it does, part of it for me comes back to that idea of um, the way that, the, the way that place can shape a person so it's it's connected with like again for me i think with um you know landscape topography geology itself which you, you might you and i realize you might want to say something about as well in terms of you know um creative practice and uh well yeah geology and so on but it's also i think Definitely in terms of what in the, in the way I've approached it and the characters I've written about, it's all about what it's also about what, what's, what's happened in that landscape. So, you know, the industrial landscape in particular with the black country. And then a bit like you said, you know, I killed Margaret Thatcher in well, all, all the novels really, but I think that particularly is like very conscious of that shift from um, an industrial society to a to a post-industrial one. Um and and then again like what what that what that shift and what that change in um um activity but also uh, that was a change in the landscape as well in the way it looked like we mentioned in Mary Hill and the idea of the tower and whatever like completely different to to what um had existed before so that's a big thing for me and then it and then more widely about regional literature it's um it's, well, it's, it, it almost feels strange, I don't, and again, like, you might want to say something about this yourself or, or to open it out, but it, it's some, it often feels strange to me that things are not regional literature, like there can, there can be a story being told that is not in some way regional, because how, how can it exist without being in a, in a certain... Yeah, I, mean, I know what you mean, there's a, yeah. there's a, there is a proper distinction between, a, you know, to, on, on some level, all literature is about characters within a landscape, yeah. moving across a landscape in some sense or within places. But I think what regionality and what regional literature does that's distinct, for me at least, uh, and I think kind of riffing off what you said as well, is that it's, it's about one of the fundamental concerns is the way in which people and place interact. And that's not necessarily the case in other literatures that happen to be in places. Yeah. It becomes a kind of symbolically charged space. It becomes yeah. the kind of compost for the drama as much as it is anything else. Yeah, definitely. Because um, it always feels a bit diluted. I, I mean, I know obviously it's about, this is about, you know, 
personal response, experience, history, taste, everything. But it always feels a bit diluted to me. If there's not that interaction in terms of a story. If there's not that interaction with with place, because I, I guess that's the sort of background sort of come from. And then um, it's also interesting because I think I think it's a it's a it's a category and it's a term to be celebrated. I think I think it's a really um, um, I think it's quite it's a it's quite a strong term and it's quite I'm, I'm quite proud to be referred re referred to as a regional writer in the way that I think I think possibly elsewhere in the culture that might be a bit more um, you know um, ambiguous a term in terms of like um, yeah are you parochial you know there's other <laughs> yeah there's other there's other sort of snobberies and whatever going on and to bring it back the black country i mean i think what's definitely been important to me has been like representing um like a particular part of the culture and that comes through language and 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 then and, and behavior and definitely interaction with with place so um yeah just with that with that passage like um so Johnny's drawings of the cable cars all stem from the one cable, you know, the cable car that goes up to the castle yeah. in the zoo. And he sort of draws that as if it's been like extended and it runs through the town. And there's these sort of more fantastical um, interpretations of the town itself. Like, like, um, like Sean talking about the singing cavern being like, a, you know, having to have a ship to sail across it. So it's, but it's grounded in real, and it is fantastical, like with the fossils and the cavern, you know, in real life, it is. It's, it's sort yeah. of um, this other world, particularly with, you know, the world beneath. Yeah, like, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, for, for those that are listening and that have never been to the Dudley Canal Trust, you know, go and get yourself down there and take a little trip down underneath the, the caverns of Dudley because it is a, it's, a, it's an incredible experience. Um, yeah. It really is. But and I, I think there's I, something that you've touched on there as well, Anthony, about kind of, black country nurse generally you know i mean uh carrie hadley price says something about this in her work about how the black country is not just a, a place itself it's a state of mind and that kind of imagined element of the region is a really important kind of aspect of black countryness or at least one of the layers of it yeah i think i think so that's a brilliant way of describing it actually and her, you know yeah i think her work it's definitely within that sensibility, isn't it? Of, of both, like, well, you know, in, in Kerry, like the examples of Kerry's work would be like it's written in a re it's a realist, a realist story. It's written in this realist mode, and yet there's there's this there is the kind of sense of otherworldliness, whether it's like through atmosphere or th or definitely through sense of place, even in things like so in their novel, the black in, in her novel, Black Country, where the um where where they drive, that's near Kimber, I think. It's where there's no, you know, there's no there's no verge and there's no pavement and it's where the sort of the roads sort of sort of start to close in and like yeah. and there's a character driving along it so there's a real sense of claustrophobia alongside this thing of being in the kind of edge land so it's like you know it's not it's not urban but it's not really like fully like rural and countryside particularly that particularly out that way um and yeah it's i think I mean, my settings are probably they're probably slightly more urban because of the, because of the Dudley thing and um, yeah, the relationship with the hills. They live on they live on Cade Seal in the book, and they kind of look across to um, the castle and the hill, and a lot of their family history is in and around that the, that that space between the hills and um, and the surrounding area. So yeah kind of bound up with it in the same way um i suppose there's a, like over there's overlapping histories with a lot of the families i've written about so cairo jukes who you mentioned there's a bit in that book where his dad's obsessed with like local history and that but he's also traced the family tree and everything but he's he knows he's like i'm trying to work out the time he might it's his granddad or his great granddad so they dug the it was a quarryman like at the at the zoo so like so where the animal enclosures in the zoo are like that like that was quarry workings where you know it's been dug out for the for the works for the for the um iron works and that when they were digging out all the you know ironstone limes limestone and all that for the for, for iron working so there's this um relationship between the 
the kind of personal histories and then your kind of family stories and family history and then and and the actual um the actual you know landscape the actual ground mm. I don't it's not it's not it's not peculiar to us is it it's it's interesting you know talking to you from south Wales, like so we moved like we moved we moved to cardiff my wife grew up in cardiff but obviously in terms of the you know if you want to very different in lots of ways but comparable sort of um you know pattern and response to the landscape you know you've got south wales valleys which you know regard regarding the culture around the, the mines and, and coal and stuff is really fascinating and very specific and um you get a similar kind of folklore ish quality yeah. about that as well don't you yeah um, um, I, I don't know whether lisa wants to jump in here because it, it might be useful to hear something about somebody who's from a similar region but that's very very distinct in her work on stoke as well which has still got that kind of throb of industry yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. being left behind Go on, Lisa. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, well, I was kind of interested in, in Anthony trying to you, almost define what we mean by regional regionality. Do you know what I mean? And I think for a word to exist, for a term to exist, it almost requires definition. But actually, when you, you know, I don't know about you as a writer, but when you're kind of t spoken about as a regional writer, people just assume that you write about the North. Do, do you know what I mean? Nobody kind of yeah. sees regionality or regional writing as being anywhere south of the M25 yeah. for some reason. Uh, and I, I don't know why that is. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? It's why it has this kind of moniker that it is all about the North and it's all about post-industrialism. Do, do you know what I mean? Because it, it is also, I mean, one of the things you've been kind of talking about is this idea of excavating stories from the past which I think we all do. I know Charlie does that in her in her works. Rob, you certainly do in your poetry and you've certainly done it in your novels, Anthony. It's about taking those stories for the past, but trying to make them relevant now. Um, because it is about that process of deindustrialization that has kind of enabled us to tell stories from the impact of it. Mm. And, and one of the things that you have done, I feel, mm. is, is look at it from a very masculine point of view, actually. The, you know, in that relationship, you've got a real relationship with, uh, did you call it a post-industrial limbo? <laughs> and, and gender, and particularly the, the way that that affects masculinity. I've gone completely off point from the other question. No, but, uh, right. I was right, really interested, sorry, in, in that kind of what you were saying, yeah. That kind of impotence thing, I think, is a big... Um, it's, yeah, it's a big issue and theme in my, you're right, in that mm -hmm. shift. And it, and it is about, it is definitely about, um, like, yeah, male identity, I suppose, you know, for the most part, it's about what wouldn't, what would like be called, like, yeah, white working class male identity in that, in that mm -hmm. respect. So it is very, I suppose it's specific, yeah, it goes back to that thing about being specific, I suppose. But um, yeah, I, um, I mean, it can end up a bit of a straight jacket that because I think there is also a way of, of so I know that, um, so I've ended up and, and partly started it with, with Iron Towns really, thinking about a much longer sweep of time because in almost like the way that, um, I suppose if you talk, I, th I suppose if you're thinking about it, in it there's like a trauma, there's a, there's, a, there's a type of trauma to the post industrialization But equally, and I think there's a lot of writing that deals with this. There's a, there was a, tra there's a trauma to industrialization. It's not like, uh, and I think that, you know, it's not like this nostalgic, it's not, there are elements of nostalgia, definitely in my, my writing, but it's not like this kind of nostalgic looking back, you know, that kind of more, um, sort of dang hopefully that sort of not the that kind of dangerous nostalgic sort of things were better in in yeah. them days yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of attitude it's more about um uh being well being caught up in bigger events about which you've got no control over so there's not there's not loads of cause and effect 
I'm not sure, in like a lot of them, um, or rather that like the cause of like massive job losses or the fact that like there's like loads of coal just under the surface is like, um, and the effect of it, they're like quite remote, aren't they? If you're like living yeah. in that particular place, whereas, yeah, yeah. so that's, that maybe that's, there's another aspect to it. Um, yeah, we have gone a bit off, sorry, what we were... No, what we, well, I, what, I, what, we were, what we're talking we're, about is the fact that what you're dealing with in the past, and I, and I mean, certainly me as a, as a writer who often looks back at Stoke-on-Trent and the history of Stoke-on-Trent, and that in itself is a region that is then fragmented into six other regions because it's made up of six towns. So you've actually got the city that exists with no centre. So it, it, in a way, it's kind of placeless, <laughs> you know, it, and it's also sandwiched between the heady lights of Manchester and the southern lights of Birmingham. And, you know, it's kind of sits in between neither here nor there, but it is a region within itself that is too south for the north, but too north to be belonging to the West Midlands. Do, do you see what I mean? And, and so actually that's what really fascinates me about writing about this place, because actually I think I'm writing about regions within regions within regions <laughs> within regions. Yeah, yeah. Um, where I think what you know what what you're what you've been writing about, and certainly looking at your trajectory of your work as well, there seems to be this real strong thematic through it uh, about the Black Country in particular, serving up all these sort of regional. Um, sort of magical, wonderful moments that are, are lending themselves to stories through the eyes of various different generations of men. Do, do, yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 no, yeah, yeah. Your characters are so masculine. You know, they are very al alpha masculine in the ways that they are footballers, whether they're dreadful or not. <laughs> uh, you've got boxers. Um, you know, in, in, there's all this kind of response to Brexit in what you're doing, but you've got these warring male generations within families over their political choices. Do, do, do you know what I mean? And I'm always, you know, are you conscious of, of that male voice being your mouthpiece, I suppose, for what you want to say about those regions? Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I don't, I, um, I think, I think they probably have, like in retrospect, I can, there is that, there's definitely that sort of a, closeness of um those patterns yeah describing the same sort of sort of family patterns especially that you that, that you're describing um and I, I, yeah does that just go does that go back to the writing about the specifics of something i'm sort of conscious that um I like that. That regions within regions thing is is interesting, and I think probably a lot of the a lot of the black country people here would identify with that because there's there's a big. I think there's probably there's a big difference between writing about yeah a, a, a sort of a Dudley a Dudley novel compared with actually compared with where I was just described. You know, making mention of going out to Kimber. I mean, that's like you might as well be what. 100 miles away or whatever maybe not that exaggerated but you know what i mean there's a very like there's a kind of locality there's a there's a localism i think maybe that's a way of talking about it that i think we're trying to describe and i think what i think what you were just talking about regarding stoke that applies it seems to anyway in your work so a very local very localized reaction and a local kind of culture um within within a kind of bigger like sort of region so yeah i am conscious of that masculine voice i mean i'm probably trying to move away from it a little bit but that's more to do with this opening out both in terms of in terms of time scale and um and experience so um it's not i don't think it's like a massive agenda or, or not consciously on my part to have done that but but I do think, yeah, I do think there is something about that experience specific to that sort of, um, uh, that identity of like, you know, foundry workers, steel workers, um, um, in the past in the black country and then elsewhere, having mentioned South Wales, you know, the culture around like mining and so on. But yeah, definitely was something about, um, 
a perception of a male role, which, which, like, which again, not not just the, so not just creatively, but obviously there's then a lot of issues like that that creates within a society, you know, and, and a lot of straight sort of straight jacket to sort of try and live within. Um, I think possibly that's what there are elements of that's what. Um, like Johnny and Sean are struggling with in, in the bit in the bit that I read even, you know, that sort of well what what is it what am I meant to be doing here, you know? And um yeah, you should fight fire with fire. He's like one of the, you know, that whole sort of I don't know, like uh, uh, like aggression, really, I suppose, is is part of the is part of the makeup of it. Yeah. There's a kind of gentleness to to lots of your male characters as as well, though. And there's a there's just there's almost a kind of gracefulness about some of them as well. I mean, like even, you know, like Johnny's kind of tough and and whatnot, but he, he's also very, very tragic. And, you know, he's the artistic one in the neighborhood as well. And yeah. even somebody like Cairo Dukes, you know, he, he's tough and he, you know, you don't want to get on the wrong side of him. But, you know, when, when there are scenes in the cut where he's kind of trying to get match fit again, there's a, there's a real deliberation and, you know, conscious kind of placing of feet that's that you can only do when you're kind of dedicated to that craft as well so there is there is a sense of grace about these characters and, and i definitely get a sense that they're in this state of conflict it's, and it's a yeah. conflict of location it's a conflict of landscape and it's a conflict of how do i be a man now when all those rules have changed yeah yeah do you well. think it's an element I think I've been what's something I have become increasingly aware of actually with like in terms of what Lisa was acting there's also there's that performative element to it and that you know and it's particularly true like it's more true in like that individual to the the, the idea of the boxer particularly so with Cairo being a boxer this because it's individual and it's very exposed obviously in all sorts of ways but there's also this element of performance and that's true of the, the characters the it's true of the football stuff it's been useful writing about sport in that way because there's this element of um of acting out an identity so um like the, like the performance of being tough aggressive or whatever and a kind of consciousness to it that like um yeah that i think quite a few of the more the more recent characters like cairo and um liam in iron towns i think are conscious of as well and it's almost like well have i got to act like this? is this how I've, is this how i've got to act is this is this how i um, yeah, that, that is this almost like they're trying the skin on. In this, yeah, yeah, and not feeling. And I think, I think possibly, maybe that's that link with work. It's much more self-conscious because it's because because of some of the other bigger identities having been um, taken away regarding industrial identity and so on. Maybe other other um, other identities are, are sort of you know, fill the void or to, to, you know, adapt. And I think I think the characters are maybe struggling with, well, how is it that I act now? And there is a sensitivity, mm. there's a sensitivity to it, I think, in that sense, Rob, like, yeah, in the fact that they're con it's like there's a self-consciousness, there's a self-consciousness yeah. to it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and I think it is a, di I think that's a genuine dilemma, you know. Um, mm. Do you think that's linked to, partly to, um, so in terms of identifying as a black country, like regional identity has really strengthened in lots of ways, you know, as, as a post-industrial culture, because I'm guessing like, well, I, th I think it's right. So, although we got the, obviously the black country existed, you know, that was as it's named around the industries and stuff, but there was a lot more of the kind of um, the elements of the local, like based around like very localized industries and things like that. So somewhere like, um, Craig Lee said was all was all formed around like chain making and, and chain yards and stuff and would have seen itself connected with the other chain towns, but very much of, of itself and with a really kind of um hyper sort of local culture and behavior. And it's and it's it's more recently there's been this there's a sort of subsequent greater black country sort of identification because of. Yeah, because of accent and because of the way that um, those kind of very local and differentiate the, the very local differentiations regarding industry and, and that. Have, yeah, I mean, have, I, I think I think you're right. You know, I think uh, um, and maybe lots of other post-industrial areas feel similarly. 
but I think there's definitely a sense that you know, and that there are there's evidence of this as well, really. That you know, the the flag, for example, yeah. is, is a is a post millennial thing. Yeah, so we got behind the flag as a symbol of the region way after the steelwork closed. Yeah, uh, you know, Billy Spakeman has done quite a lot of work on the linguistics of the region, and 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 quite a lot of his ideas are kind of rooted around um, how we've kind of clung on to the the accent and clung on to the peculiarities, the grammar and the dialect more since we don't have those localised community and, and labour uh, epicentres anymore as well. So there is a sense of that, I think. Um, there's, there's something else I really want to ask you anyway, Anthony, because I'm, I'm aware that time's kind of moving on. Um, so, and, and, and part of this, I think, if we're talking about regional literature, and it's difficult to define and it's difficult to know what it does that's slightly different. But I think we've done some good thinking there about what it is and what black country literature does as well. Um, your, your novel, your, your first three at least, uh, came out with Tyndall Street Press. And you as a writer kind of came out of the same local scenes as people like Dave Reeves, Paul MacDonald, Catherine O'Flynn. So... My question is really, how important was the Birmingham-based press and the kind of grassroots scene to your writing and your future? Um, and are there similar patterns that need to be in place for other regional literatures to do well? Because black country literature is on a, on a great wave at the moment and has been yeah. for, for two decades, I'd say. Yeah, well... I mean, I think I think it's hard. It's hard for me to um, exaggerate the uh, impetus and like and and just support and encouragement that I got from Tinder Street and from the writers connected to it and all the people connected to it. I think that's exactly right. So I just I don't even I'm not I'm not sure I would have been sending work to publishers like if. If there hadn't been that mechanism for, for me, so like um, there used to be a there was the the, the um, there used to be a magazine in the libraries called Raw Edge, and it yeah, was the one that was that, Dave um, Reeves. It was just it was if it, yeah, that was Dave Reeves' uh, magazine, wasn't it? And then yeah, he yeah. so they had a yeah so they had they had stuff about Tinder Street in it, and then also like a sort of plea for like submissions, but saying we want writing set in like in the in the black country and I'd been doing you know a bit of writing and was not really well that confident I suppose in approaching um I don't know what would you call it like what, you, what you'd see as mainstream publishing or certainly agents and whatever and um and so it was great so I sent something to them and they and, and, and Raw Edge published um a story of mine and they'd also been promoting Tinder Street so that was, was through that that I ended up speaking to Tinder Street, who, um, who at the time were a couple of years old. So I guess if, if people don't know, so Tinder, Tinder Street was a writer's group that had existed from the 70s and is still going um, with um, really, you know, various um, Birmingham writers and, and connected um, Black Country -like writers likewise. Um, so like, Joel Lane was a member, wasn't he? I know that, like, I think you, they, they were doing, you were doing a celebration of his work, like, recently. So that's where his work, his work had come from, the writers' group. And then and then from the writers' group, um, a publisher's was was created and, you know, published fiction and then some some crime, but all of it with a real commitment to regional um, li regional literature, um, particularly, like, Birmingham and West Midlands, but equally, um, they published some really good books, like... Uh, like quite a few writers from around Hull, like Russ Litton and um, mm. um, uh, Daphne Glazer. Uh, so um, I'm not sure. It, it, yeah, it gave me a, both like a, a way in, I think, to, to publishing and even to thinking about publishing, actually. I think that's probably more important. So the whole idea that there is a route and that's a, that's a route, so you can see what, what the kind of, what the progression is. So there's, this is a writer's group and here are the libraries and there's a magazine in the library and that connects to the publishers and you can, you know, you can send work to these places. And there was a pattern there. Yeah, there's see. a proper kind of uh, local 
yeah. literary ecosystem happening. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, I guess in, I mean, things have changed, obviously. So Tinder Street, uh, that, I mean, that's not just in Tinder Street now. Tinder Street was, Tinder Street was then sort of came to an end and was bought by um, Serpent's Tail, or, who are in turn owned by Profile Books, which is still, sort. they're still sort of, I think, like, small and relatively independent regarding publishing, but, um, you know, London-based, a bigger sort of, uh, well, different agenda, I guess. So it's, it's a very different thing. So, I mean, I wonder what, what you think now about now, because obviously, the I mean, the university generates a lot of, a lot of the culture around, um, like, you know, publishing, how to get published, if you're writing about, you know, life in the West Midlands, I guess, I guess you've got the, the university and then... Yeah, I mean, I suppose then, that we, we, we do a pretty good job here at the University of Wolverhampton of kind of uh, connecting people in different ways and connecting local scenes in different ways. Um, I guess in, in some ways the, the, the mood of the landscape has changed somewhat in the sense that fiction regionally is kind of uh, dipping, whereas the poetry scene yeah. since, since sort of 2000 and seven or whatever onwards has, has uh, got a lot more bold yeah um so th th those are sudden changes and we, we, you know that the, there are networks like writing west midlands and uh, creative black country and black country touring that are doing lots and lots of really interesting things to do similar things to to what you just said um i just want to uh give the mic to charlie a second because i'm aware that i've witted on quite a lot and uh want to give her a a stab at the mic, uh, and then right. we need to we need to uh, pass on to, to Lisa to make a couple of announcements as well. Uh, no, not all. my my only kind of um, injection into that is that I remember when I was like shakily stepping onto a stage for the first time to try and to try and be a to try and be a poet, and um, and even though so I'm I'm Worcester based and have been for for much of my life apart from a, a brief soiree into Bristol where I absolutely did not make the most of their of their literary scene at all and if I had my run at it again I would I would do it all very differently um, and even though Worcester um, has kind of a, a couple of local publishing houses I've worked with them they are they are amazing people even outside of opportunities to get published I don't think I can possibly stress enough what a confidence building exercise it was as much as anything else to liaise with other with other local writers and whether we were writing about Worcester or whether we were writing about something entirely separate like it's only as I've got it's only as I've got older and as my work has kind of shifted slightly that I've started to look at pockets of regionality and I've started to talk to my granddad a lot more as he's got older and he is very much like black country born and bred kind of kind of thing so it's only as I've got older that I've started focusing on the regional element anyway but but now you know like I run my own open mic night in Worcester and and the literary ecosystem to kind of steal steal Rob's phrase there that that supports young talent and fosters young talent I think whether there is kind of a publishing hub there or not there is something to be said for this kind of peer network that comes about through connecting with other local writers and and even if it's as simple as I've never been to an open mic night before and I would really like the support for it the, there will be other local writers that, that will kind of coach you through that as as necessary and and you know it's not specific to Worcester by any stretch of the imagination like there are there are these kind of pockets pockets of support appearing in all in all sorts of regions um, and I guess you know kind of it speaks to the to the regional hub of the conversation in many ways that like the, there is that creative network just kind of pulsing away i suppose hmm. for, for many for and, many and if it's not there build it and they will yeah. come yeah very, yeah, that's very a good much point, so. yeah. yeah very much so i think that's that's the other thing to consider as well is that is is that if you if you feel that you're in a region that doesn't have that kind of life force behind it yet it's not necessarily that there's not 
the or rather that there aren't people ready and eager to contribute to it it's more that they just don't have the outlet for it yet and i think if 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 the there's i suppose the regionality of a region for one of for want of a less clunky way of putting it if that if that kind of ancestral feel to where are we from where have we been where are we going isn't isn't there it doesn't it doesn't mean it isn't there but only that it hasn't been capitalized on yet and i and i think yeah. that's that's probably part of the beauty of regional writing is that and and i was thinking this earlier but i never i don't want to interrupt anyone um this this kind of this ancestral lineage that that we create through through regional writing like we're we're making a time capsule for for an entire space yeah, that's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment, Charlie. Um, we, we, we're going to have to move fairly quickly, but there's a couple of questions in the chat and in the Q&A that I, I think we should, we should just as, as brief, relatively briefly, but at, at least attend to. Um, we've got a beautiful question here from a, a student in France who is studying and working on spectrality, uh, Derrida in particular, uh, the spectrality of the proletariat in the contemporary novel. Uh, and is looking at your work, Anthony, uh, as part of the study, uh, with an aim to study the spectrality of the residues of the working class. Uh, and wants to know whether you recommend any other uh, fiction uh, that deal with these sorts of residues. Um, right, I will. I, I'll come back to that. I'll, make a, I'll, I'll try and have a think and make a list because that's a. Well, it's a great question, first of all, and that is um, that's a brilliant thing to hear in itself. You know, the whole um, scope of the study and the fact that um, you know you're sending that message in. Um, yeah, I, 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 I choose for, for Joel Lane. Joel Lane well, is a great as, starting as somebody point. Somebody who's looking at uh, kind of spectrality and uh, lost cultures and yeah. people that have kind of been disenfranchised and are haunted by that. Joel Lane is a great writer for that. Um, the, there's another question from Martin who's uh, asking, are black country narratives and characters dark by nature? Should we go back to Kerry Adley Price? There's a passage in Black, yeah. I'm sure there's a passage in black Country that deals with that question directly. And um, and I um, there's also, there's a bit in um, uh, some of you might look at this with, and I know um, Rob will have with um, work and stuff, but um, Paul McDonald's, I think it was his PhD thesis, but from fiction to the from fi fiction from the furnace, there's this study he did of, of black country writers, and there's some great bits in that about duality rather than darkness, and this mm. whole playing on the sense of. You know, even the term black country, you've got this idea of both um, urban and rural. You've got like the, the, the blackness of coal and the greenness of the hills and so on. You've got these kind of sets just. Of like of the culture and um, that equally. Yeah, it relates a bit to what Lisa was saying about um, um, the the kind of in between thing. You know, the Midlands, being in the Midlands, you know, facing this kind of thing of facing both ways, or a kind of sense of um, yeah, uh, this sense of duality. So not so yeah. much if there's a darkness, it's, there's then there's a bit of a laugh on the other side of it, isn't there? You know, it's yeah. Sort of, but, but I was going to say that actually, Anthony. But even, even the funny writers are quite dark as well. Like yeah. Paul McDonald's novels are hilarious, but yeah there's there's darkness in there as well it's a kind of way of coping for some of the characters as well isn't it and it, even someone who's a hilarious like mira sayal is very very funny but she she's also quite dark and deals with fairly dark uh questions as well i wonder uh, how much that speaks to kind of like the folk horror element of of black country living really and just yeah. and and these kind of <laughs> these kind of old narratives that that have carried forwards and like uh, do you know rob you're a prime example of this like stories like bella and 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 kind of how that how that's 
bled into contemporary culture and contemporary retellings. I, I just wonder how much um, kind of our, our natural background, I say our, the, or the West Midlands natural background in kind of folk, folk yeah. narratives and horror narratives and kind of the, I suppose, the, the complicated relationship that's come about through those two things over, over the years and mm. whether that has any, any influence I think it's it's really that, interesting, isn't it? And maybe this maybe this kind of comes back to Anthony's earlier passage about uh, the, the caverns under Dudley. You know, it's like the the grounds that gave rise to the cultures, the 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 millennia, eons uh, of Earth's movements and shifts and temperature changes, uh, gave rise to the the cultures and communities in the Black Country. So. It, and, and it, so it, it's coming from that kind of mystical underground place right from the word go. Uh, and and the, the trade and the culture and the language is all deeply connected to that kind of primal, those primal shifts as well. So I think that's definitely one of the focuses in black country literature. If it's not solely geological, it's at least attached to the topography and the, the soils. Um, and, and maybe that's a big part of regional literature itself is the way in which it digs down and the way in which it approaches the layers of landscape and the layers of place that other perhaps metropolitan writers don't. Uh, Lisa, uh, before we uh, move on to you, uh, I want to say a massive thanks to Anthony. Uh, it's been really lovely listening to you and talking to you again. And thanks for sharing your work. Uh, and a huge thanks for everybody uh, for coming along this evening. Uh, it means a lot to us uh, to have you along for the ride. Uh, and let me pass on to our uh, course leader, Dr. Lisa Blower, to give you some exciting news. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Thanks, everyone. No, honestly, thank you, Anthony. I mean, honestly, we could uh, debate this all night, couldn't we? Uh, about what is regional literature, what is regionality? And uh, I suppose that's a very good tenuous segue into the fact that from September 2022, uh, we will be launching a MA in regional writing here at the University of Wolverhampton. Um, its main aim really is to offer the opportunity for students to really get to grips with this notion of what we mean by regional writing, what is regionality, uh, to dispel all these notions that often work against regional writers as well, you know, and, and that it's not about confining uh, the practice to these homogenized traditional ideas. Um, you know, we want to explore it as a subject, as a genre, as a thematic that celebrates place and belonging and identity and cross-culturalisms and language and class and dialect use in particular, which is something that we've only very briefly touched on tonight, but has become so important um, and so yeah it, 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 we started in September it is a taught MA it will feature um, around about nine hours of face-to-face uh, -face teaching uh, and obviously a lot of uh, individual study work alongside. Uh, we're also uh, really pleased to say that this MA will feature work with external partners on public facing projects, uh, which uh, will have students working with them to enhance their regional agendas. And hopefully all work will culminate in a postgraduate symposium uh, that we will host alongside our friends in CTTR. Um, so it's it's all very exciting. Uh, it all plays to all our expertises as well as uh, fellow writers. Um, you'll also have the opportunity of working with people like Anthony, <laughs> who we're going to be uh, obviously inviting to be part of this, um, because we are going to be pulling in lots of people who are writing about regions, regionality in every shape or form um, because it's not just about places it can also to be 
regions of the body for interest if uh, you know there's lots and lots of different things that we're going to be looking at um, and through two modules one will be called understanding regionality and then semester two will be focused upon lives within the region uh, if you've got any questions about it if there's any um, level six third year students here who are interested in having a natter about it please send me an email um, and also just to let you know uh, I know some of you might not be in the market for it just yet but as part of this kind of relaunch of creative writings postgraduate department um, you will also find that we are currently advertising for a studentship for a PhD in creative writing uh, with us here at Wolverhampton which is also great news uh, it is a one-year fees paid studentship uh, and uh, you can find all the information if you go to uh, jobs.acuk and type in uh, studentships at Wolverhampton University and you'll find all the information there otherwise send me an email but thank you, thank you for, uh, and thank you, Anthony, for coming along tonight and helping us kind of celebrate all this, because as I say, from September, we'll be doing a lot of that. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. Thanks a lot for saying that again. I'm, I'm typing, because I'm just typing in a couple of writers for that um, question about the, yeah, responses to sort of um, post-industrialism. It's really great news about the Masters, so like, well done. Yeah, we've been working involved. on it working on it for two years so actually yeah. to see this in fruition now is quite wonderful but uh yeah Sharon Duggle would be another one um who's a Birmingham based well she was Birmingham based but she writes an awful lot about Birmingham Handsworth Times should we fall behind uh a, a good place to start is actually with Blue Moose books because um yeah. they do tend to champion an awful lot of regional fiction Oh yeah, oh, we can uh, put the, uh, Yeah, he's uh, he's wonderful. Yeah, in fact, in, on that note, it's regarding that question, um, yeah, Adele Stripe, you know, oh, and Adele and Ben, uh, Ben Myers, he's also yeah, very, yeah. Um, we could go on. <laughs> no, yeah, definitely, yeah, uh, uh, of course. No, that's that's, that's great. Um, and thanks again, Lisa, and everyone for having me. No, it's our pleasure, Anthony. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, guys, uh, and. I'm, have a lovely Easter, have a lovely uh, evening, and we hope to see you soon. Ta-ra!